Hello students and welcome to the guided exercises for chapter 12. Um, today we are going to be talking about the cost of capital and weighted average cost of capital and different capital structures for a company, which is a topic that was covered in financial management and we'll just be discussing this some more in terms of how we can make some of these calcula uh, calculations within Excel. So the first spreadsheet that we have here is we're going to figure out what is the weighted average cost of capital for a company. And we're going back to this formula here, which is basically that the weight for any particular um, part of our capital structure is then multiplied times um, the required return for that particular um, class. And so we've got D for debt here, and we've got P for preferred stock, and then we've got E for equity, okay? Now you notice that for preferred stock and for equity, um, we just take the weight or the percentage of the portfolio, uh, the financing portfolio that is made up of that part times the rate. Okay, and then for debt, it's slightly different because the interest payments that you make on your debt are actually tax deductible. So your overall expense at the end of the day, after you get a tax deduction for that interest, means that um, the amount that you end up having for um, that weighted portion is the weight or the percentage in the portfolio times the um, required required rate uh, of, re and then we multiply that times one minus the tax rate. So say if your tax rate was 40%, then you would take the weight, you know, say it was half of the, your portfolio, your financing portfolio be 0.5 times um, whatever percentage rate times 0.6, which is one minus your tax rate of 0.4. So that's the formula that we're dealing with here today. And we have a company that has a tax rate of 35%, their cost of debt is 12%. So we're gonna also, we're gonna first wanna calculate what is our after-tax cost of debt because this gross here um, is gonna be before tax. So all we need to do to get that after-tax part is to take that rate that is in box B4 and then multiply that times one minus our tax rate in B3. And then that's gonna give us an after-tax cost of debt of 8%. All right, so um, then we know that we have 30% of our financing is made up of debt, 15% of our financing is preferred stock, and 55% of our financing is made up of common equity. The required return for debt is 8%, which we see that's already been carried down here um, uh, because that is linked. So it's referring back to that box B5 that we calculated, all right? And then the other two were provided to us. So to get our weighted average cost of capital, the easiest way to do this um, is we can use the sum product function. I mean, we could do, um, you know, box B7 times box B8, you know, in parentheses plus box, you know, B8 times C8 and so on and so forth. But it's actually easier to just use the sum product function. Um, and then we put the ranges for our two sections, all right? So, and you say, all right, we're gonna take the equivalent ones in um, column B times the um, ones next door in column C. So we're gonna say for our first range is gonna be B7 through B9. And so that's gonna grab that column and then it's gonna multiply that times the respective item in order in um, C7 through C9, all right? And so that way we can just multiply those across and then it's gonna sum all of those up at the same time. So boom, it'll be done and that's gonna give us our 15.44% weighted average cost of capital. So it's just a shortcut you can use for multiplying and then adding um, the sums of all of those products together. You use that sum product function. In our next exercise here, we're gonna be looking at the market value of an enterprise here. So in our, in our previous chapters, um, we've been talking a lot about financial statements. And, um, and if you remember, we have this accounting equation where um, 
we have our assets equals our liabilities plus our stockholders equity. And most of those are expressed in terms of historical cost and what, or what we originally paid for them or what debt we originally incurred for them. But when we're looking at finance projects where we're uh, planning for cash flows, sometimes we'll restate those in terms of market values. So we're going to look at uh, a company and we're, you know, from the standpoint that the market value of their assets um, is the market value of their debt plus the market value of their equity. And basically what that means is our market value of our assets is the value that we expect as a firm to generate from the assets and the property, plant, and equipment of a company. And then the market value of the debt is the value of the firm's um, debt if it were to be traded out on the open market. So like their bond issuances and whatnot. And so this is basically like a price tag. If someone was to go out and buy all of a company's debt offerings, what would those be? And then the market value is the value of the, the firm's assets minus any um, obligations that they have to those debt holders. So basically we can say that we've got the the market value of the company equals um, the equity plus their debt all right so um, with that in mind we can take uh, we've got here um, bond issuances that were created for this company number one number two and number three and the market value if someone were to purchase all of those bonds out on the market here and so the total value market value of the debt for this company is just going to be the sum of those from b5 through b7 and then the firm's value is then going to be um, b3 that market value of equity plus the value of that debt in B9. Whoops. Oh, I got to Yeah, there we go. Um, and then ultimately, um, we come down to the weight of our debt. So what portion of our financing overall um, is from debt in our capital structure? Well, we can back into that by taking um, the market value of the debt divided by the overall firm value, which is the market value of our assets. So we just take um, that market value of debt divided by B9 divided by B10 here. And so 55.56 in our weighted capital structure that we were talking about in problem number one, the weight of our debt is 55.56%. In problem three here, we're going to continue on with the same concept of the market value of our assets being equal to the market value of a company's debt plus the market value of the equity. And we're also going to talk about what some of the components are for understanding um, what the market value of equity is or how to figure that, that market value out. So here we are given some information. We've got um, shareholder equity in millions. Um, we've got the number of shares that are outstanding. We have a price per share. We have the book value of the company's debt. And we also have um, the percentage of face value um, that is the market value of the debt. So if you remember from corporate fi or from financial management, we would say like if a bond was stated at 90, if it was selling at 90, that meant it was selling at 90% of its face value. So that's what we've got showing up here. So our market value of our equity here, we can figure out by taking the number of shares that we have outstanding and multiplying it times the price per share. And that is also called our market capitalization. So we're just gonna take equals B5 times B6 here. And then um, the market value of our debt ends up just being um, the book value of our debt, um, which is stated on our books at the um, face value, and then we're going to multiply that times um, the um, percentage of face value in box B8. So, so B7 times B8 here. All right. And so our firm value, if you remember, um, is going to be equal to, um, so we have the market value of the assets equals the market value of our debt plus the market value of our equity. Well, guess what? Now we know what those are. So we can just do um, the sum of our market value of our equity 
and the market value of our debt to get our firm value. And then ultimately, in order to um, determine what our weight in equity is, we can just take um, the portion of our financing that is from equity in terms of market value and then divide that by our overall firm value to get the weight in our equity. So we have 96.37% weight in equity, which is, which is very high. In this problem, we're going back to that same topic where um, if a bond is stated at, um, you know, at 90 or 110 or whatever, it, that's the percentage of its face value at which it is selling. So we can back into the bond price by saying our, if our face value in B, um, in B6, or I'm sorry, if our face value uh, is 90% of our, um, uh, or I'm sorry, our sale price is 90% of our face value. We just take B6 and then multiply that times B4 to get that. So $900 is what the bond is selling at. The coupon, um, just as a refresher, is going to be your coupon rate, um, which is in B5, also times your face value in B4. And then your yield to maturity then um, ends up being, we're gonna use the rate function, which um, that's going to return the interest rate for a loan or investment. And we're going to take for our arguments here um, the term to the years of maturity because this is going to be a time value of money function. It's going to give us um, the actual time value of money rate, not just a, a flat rate. We're going to take our payment, which is in B9. That's our coupon payment. Um, the present value is going to be negative B8. Now, when you're doing these time value of money calculations, you always have to have either your present value or your future value as a negative. Now, because we are presumably purchasing this from the open market at $900, we're gonna make present value our negative, and then our future value is going to be the um, face value, which is B4. And then we don't need to enter in the type or the guess at the end. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit enter there, and that gives us a yield to maturity when purchased at $900 and then paid out at the end at $1,000 of 10.34% with that $90 uh, payment being received once per year. For our next problem, we're basically doing the same thing, only we have um, more frequent payments, all right? So we need to first figure out how many payments do we have um, or periods to maturity. Since we have semi-annual coupon frequency here, we're gonna have two payments per year. So we're gonna take the number of years uh, to maturity in B3 and multiply that times two to get the number of periods to maturity here. All right, now here they're telling us our bond price is at 105, so we're gonna take our face value in B4 and multiply that times B6 again, um, and that's gonna give us a bond price which is larger than our face value, so we're selling at a premium. Our coupon, again, is always gonna be that um, face value times our annual coupon rate in box B5. But we also have to divide that by two because um, it's getting paid out every six months, all right? And, and that coupon rate is an annual rate. So make sure that you divide it by two here. So you'll have a $40 payment, um, which is 4% paid twice per year, semi-annually, right? All right, so then we're gonna use the rate function once again um, to do our um, time value of money function here with our number of periods being the semi-annual periods, not the year. And then we're gonna have our payments being that coupon that is paid twice per year. We're gonna have um, our negative bond price in B10 as our present value, and then our face value will again be um, our future value here. So that gives us a yield to maturity of 3.4%. All right, and um, next, and that is per period, by the way. So 
the next thing that we're going to look at is going to be our cost of debt. All right. So what is the cost of our debt here? We're going to take um, one plus our yields to maturity here in B12. And then we are going to raise that to the power of two. We're going to square it and then subtract one to get our cost of debt here. So one of the things that we were doing here was basically using the effective interest rate function um, in a different way. So we can shortcut this whole process by using the effect um, formula to do the same thing. And basically we're just gonna grab that semi-annual interest rate. We're gonna multiply it times two because we want this to be an annual interest rate and that yield to maturity was per period. And then we're gonna put it times the, uh, for the number of periods here, which um, for this particular case, because of how we're doing it, we're using two for the number of periods. So basically, um, we're giving an effective interest rate of 6.92 per year, which gets us to the same answer. For problem six, we're gonna be using what's called the capital asset pricing model, which tells us what the required return would be on a, on a stock in order to make it worth investing in, right? And the components that go in there is, there's the base risk-free rate that is available out in the market. And then to that, we add what's called um, a risk premium that is specific for that company which is uh, com uh, comprised of the company's beta, um, which is the measurement of the, the risk for that stock. And then we multiply that times its market portfolio risk premium, okay? So um, what we're gonna do here then is we're just gonna price out this stock using this capital asset pricing model. So all we need to do then here is we're, in order to get the cost of equity or the required return on equity, we're going to take um, the risk-free rate in B3 and we are going to add that to um, the beta, which is the risk, uh, the risk that it, portion that is um, particular to that company, a measurement of how they fluctuate, and then we're going to multiply that times that market portfolio um, risk premium in B4. Now you could put parentheses around that B2 times B4, but due to the order of operations, it should multiply first and then add later. Now we didn't break out the components of that um, market portfolio risk premium, but um, that basically is what is comprised in, in this portion of the formula here. So our cost of equity then becomes 9.125%. In exercise seven, we're just manipulating the, um, the pricing model that we can use to calculate what uh, the reasonable expected price would be for a stock out on the market. And that consists of um, the most recent dividend times one plus the um, dividend growth rate or expected growth rate. And then that ends up being divided by um, the required um, rate minus the growth rate, okay? So when you manipulate that formula, you can actually arrive then at a way to solve for just the um, required cost of equity here, which we see down on the bottom. So we're just going to plug in that formula here to figure out what our implied cost of equity is for this company. So we're going to take our expected growth rate here, which we see over on the right in that formula, and that is going to be in B3, and we are going to add to that um, the uh, one plus the expected growth rate uh, sorry, the dividend, uh, the dividend just issued. So B2 um, times one plus the growth rate there in, in B3. And then we're gonna divide that by B4. 
which is our current stock price. So since we know the price, but we don't know the cost of equity, um, we can back into that cost of equity. And so that gets us uh, the required return on this stock is 30.31% um, based on, on that formula. And that's just the constant growth model for pricing. In problem eight, we are looking at, okay, how would we price out a share of preferred stock? And so here's the equivalent um, formula that we would use for that. And basically all we have to do is take our um, dividend divided by our um, required rate here. So in order to get this, we're just going to take um, our dividend per year growth rate times our par value um, because that dividend per year rate is that's the stated amount that you're going to get for your preferred dividends and then we're going to take that and we're going to divide it by our current stock price here so we've manipulated this and we're um, we're going back to our percentage cost for um, the stock here and so if your price is um, 87.50 then you can rearrange the formula basically to arrive at your cost of preferred stock, the required cost of preferred stock of 4.86. So in problem nine, we are going to take a bunch of these different um, things we've just done in the previous exercises and we are going to put them together to find our weighted average cost of capital for Denozo security. All right, so first we need to find here the market value of our common stock. So if you remember that, we need to get the number of shares times the price per share. So that's gonna be um, B4 here. So we have 4 million shares um, times um, the price per share of $60. So that means that we have $240 million in market value for common stock. And then the market value for our debt is going to be the current trading value of that debt, which is 90%. So it's at 90. Um, and that's going to be multiplied times the face value total for all of the debt that we have out in the market. Okay. And that face value is that stated um, par value for those, um, for all of those bonds. So then our tar our total market value just ends up being the sum of those two. So um, B21 through B22. And then um, our weight in equity, all we have to do then is um, take B21, which is the market value of the uh, common stock, and then we're going to divide that um, by B 23 our, our total market value. And notice I'm putting that in there as a uh, um, as a static so that I can just drag it down one and then I don't have to retype that for the weight and debt. But you should end up with here um, B22 divided by dollar sign B dollar sign 23 if you did that right. Okay, so then we can just with the rest of the information here, we're gonna use, we're gonna do a time value of money calculation here to figure out what is the cost of our debt. So we're gonna use that rate function um, to get the interest rate. And we're going to put for our arguments our aver average maturity in years for all of our shares. And then um, for the payment, we're again going to take the, um, the rate that we have in B8, or I'm sorry, um, B11 here, and then multiply that times the face value in B8. Oops, so B8 times B11. I can talk and type, I promise. And then um, our um, our present value is that market value that we calculated in B22. And then the final value is that um, face value um, for our argument here. And so that's going to give us 6.04% for our cost of debt. And then our cost of common equity, we're going to go back to, that's going to be um, our risk-free rate. So remember, this is going back to that capital asset pricing model. Um, plus, and then we're going to take B15, our beta, times 
um, B14, which is our market portfolio risk premium. So the market portfolio risk is the, you know, the overall market risk times the beta, which makes it specific to our company here. And so that gives us a cost of common equity of 8.6%. Now, since we know what our weights are in percentage for equity versus debt, and we now would know what the costs are, um, we can calculate our weighted average cost of capital going back to that formula that we had in, um, in our first spreadsheet here. All right, so I'm gonna just pull that back here again. So we have that for reference. And so what we're gonna have here is going to be the cost of our debt times, and then um, we're going to take one minus um, our tax rate here, all right? Because we wanna make this after tax because it's for debt and we wanna reflect those interest payments. So um, our cost of debt times one minus the tax rate to get the after tax rate. And then we're gonna multiply that times our weight for our debt, okay? Then we're gonna add to that um, our cost for our common equity times our weight for our common equity in B24. So this is uh, where the formula ends up here. Uh, and we come up with 6.47%. All right, so the last thing we're gonna do here is, is we're gonna take a weighted average cost of capital, and first we're gonna calculate it for this particular organization, and then we are going to apply it to a project cash flow to see what the net present value is for that project and the internal rate of return for that project. Um, so first we're gonna do that weighted average cost of capital. So we need to get um, our weight for our equity times the cost for our equity. All right, and then we're gonna add that to the, um, uh, sorry, the cost of our, uh, the weight for our debt, I'm sorry, times our cost of our debt. And then we're going to incorporate also multiplying that times one minus our tax rate in B6. So B2 times B4 plus B3 times B5 times one minus B6 there. All right. And then um, we have the net, we need to figure out, okay, what is the net present value of a project's cash flows given this um, cost of capital? So we're going to use the net present value function to speed this up. And then we are going to have for our arguments, our rate is our weighted average cost of capital, all right? And then the range of cash flows that we're looking at is going to be C9 uh, through F, C9 colon F9, all right? And then right parenthesis. And then to that, we are going to add in um, our initial cash flow, which is negative, okay? So we're not including that negative one at time zero. In the, um, in the range there because that's happening today. So there won't be any time value of money effect on there. It will get distorted if you include that in the range. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna do here is figure out what is the internal rate of return of this project. So that's the um, percentage rate at which your net present value in dollars ends up being zero or breaking even. And so in order to do that, all we have to do is do the IRR function and then grab our range from B9 through F9. And in the internal rate of return, it does assume an initial cash flow there. So you can just grab the whole range. And for that, we end up with an internal rate of return of 13.04% using equals ERR and then taking a range of B9 through F9. So that's it for the chapter 12 guided exercises.